Let's pray together. O Holy Spirit, come in the stillness and the quiet, like the hush of a wind, like the flight of a dove. Come and speak to us. And once again, mark us as your beloved people. In the name of Christ, our brother, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Why look, he's all grown up. That, that's what they say, isn't it? When your adult children come home after a long time. Uh, just this last fall, we went, our family went back to Dexter, where we had served while the boys were growing up for the funeral of a dear friend. We had, the boys hadn't been there together for 20 years. When we left there, Chris was a senior in high school. David was going to be a sophomore. And now for the first time since then, some of their old friends saw them and immediately they said, why are these your boys? Well, look, they're all grown up. And then whether the boys liked it or not, they said, you look just like your dad. <laughs> all grown up. Realizing that our oldest son will turn 45 this year has me saying, how did that happen? How does it happen? Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, quickly fly the years. One moment following another laden with happiness and tears. So what happens when your adult child comes home? My neighbor Floyd used to say his children brought him double joy. Joy when they came, joy when they left. <laughs> My boys are all grown up, and now when they come home, the tendency is still to try to slip back into some of those old parent-child roles. You know, the desire to protect, the desire to tell them what to do, to try to fix their world to rescue them from their own problems, to mother them like we did when they were small. But then, then we realize that they are adults now and the relationship has changed. The love, the love and the caring is still there, but it needs to be expressed in different ways. When they were little, our love could be an intervening love protecting and surrounding, shielding them from all that might hurt them. But now, now that they're grown up, such mothering love would be smothering love. Now, love has to be supportive and empowering, a love that frees them to be their own person. About 20 years have passed. Jesus reappears, all grown up. The last time we saw him, he was 12 years old, just entering puberty, trying to figure out who he was as a person, understand his own life and the meaning of it, discovering that he needed to be about his father's business. Now, all grown up. A young adult coming out into the world, trying to find his place in it, and he comes to his second cousin, John, requesting baptism. He steps into the shallow water of the muddy Jordan River, feels the cold trickle of that water dripping down the dark skin of his back as John sprinkles a little bit of that river on his curly black Middle Eastern hair, drips falling off his Palestinian beard. And Matthew says, when he had been baptized, the heavens opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And he heard a voice from heaven. And what did his parents say? This is my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. All four Gospels record the event. There's a slight difference between the two. In Matthew's gospel, it appears that the word was spoken to John, uh, addressed to the crowd about Jesus. But in Mark and Luke's gospel, it is directed 
clearly to Jesus, you are my beloved son. We, we really don't know who heard it. We don't know if anybody sensed it or experienced it except for Jesus. But for him, at that moment, it was that reaffirming, re, uh, uh, strengthening, confirming word of assurance. You are mine. You are loved. I'm pleased with you. For the young adult Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, it was that quiet, empowering, confirming moment that in the depths of his soul, he knew who he was. Beloved by his heavenly parent, chosen and blessed. And I would suggest that that is how God comes to most of us most of the time. In the same way that God relates to the adult Jesus on this day, God relates to us in the way an adult parent relates to an adult child. Not always intervening or protecting, not smothering or controlling, but freeing and empowering us to become the persons we were meant to be. And God offers us the same simple blessing that Jesus heard on this day. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are loved. That is all. But that's enough. Not unlike the adult child who calls home from Seattle or Tacoma or Missoula or Philadelphia or New York or Gettysburg or Zimbabwe or now Malawi. We've had phone calls from all of the above. You pick up the phone and you say, hey, how's it going? Uh, Not so good. Is there anything I can do? No, but I just need to talk about it. For the parent, The temptation is to try to fix it, to try to make it all better. But all we can say is, I love you. I believe in you. It's going to be all right. That is all. But that's enough. I'm convinced that that is how God comes to most of us most of the time. In those quiet moments with the gentle spirit as light as the sound of a dove, more like the freeing love of a parent who respects us and believes in us and sets us free. Now, let's be honest. There are a lot of times we wish it were otherwise. How many times, like Jesus, do we find ourselves in the wilderness of temptation? That's what happens next, you know. If you keep reading in the gospel, immediately, Mark says, immediately, Jesus was out in the wilderness for 40 days, struggling, turmoil, confusion, testing, terrifying doubt, crying out, God, don't just stand there, do something. Turn these rocky stones of my life into some kind of living bread. Get me out of here. But instead, God walks with him through that lonesome valley. God stands with us in our times of trial and testing, silently supporting us in our struggle, simply saying, You are my beloved, my son, my daughter. That's all, but that's enough. How many times, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find ourselves in the Garden of difficult decisions, difficult choices, impending dread. We struggle in prayer, and sometimes it feels like our very lifeblood is being drained out of us, trying to find a way. And like Jesus, we want to cry out to God, take this cup away. Do something. Make it go away. Let this cup pass. But like Jesus, the cup remains. The decisions are still just as real. 
the challenge just as great. We hear the simple word, you are my my beloved. I'll walk with you through the lonesome valley in the time of trial. That's all. But that's enough. How many times, like St. Paul, have we prayed, Lord, take away this thorn in my flesh. Corinthians, if you're familiar with that passage, in Corinthians, St. Paul says, three times, three times I prayed for the Lord to take away this thorn in my flesh. Now, we don't know what Paul was referring to. Some people think he was epileptic. That's why he fell off his horse on the Damascus Road. Some people think it was because he was short, kind of an inferiority complex. Most preachers think he was praying about some cantankerous church member. (laughs) Whatever it was, St. Paul says, I prayed three times for God to take away this thorn in my flesh, but there's no evidence that it was ever gone. What was the answer that he received? My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made known in your weakness. We don't know that the thorn was ever removed, but we do know God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is enough. How many times we would like to have God come in and fight our fights, solve our problems, heal all of our boo-boos, save us from the bullies, just like when we were in nursery school. But instead, God sends his quiet, gentle spirit like the flutter of dove's wings. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are loved. That's all. But that's enough. Dr. J. Ellsworth Callis was an incredible preacher, one time president of my alma mater, Asbury Seminary. He's a pro- prolific writer. He's, uh, I don't know how many books he has out there on the market. He read through the Bible every year. Every year. He had a pattern that he followed to read the whole Bible every year. And do you know what he said? Dr. Callis said, What is the plot of the Bible? It's the story of a love affair. A love affair between God and the human race. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. From the very beginning until the very end, again and again, God says, I love you. I love you. God says it in creation and at the giving of the law to Moses. God says it through the liturgy of the priest and the thundering of the prophets. God says it in a stable in Bethlehem and on a cross at Calvary. And God will say it at the consummation of all things at some moment yet to come. You are mine. You are loved. For Jesus, this day walking down into that muddy river, feeling the trickle of water down his spine was a moment of assurance, a moment of deep knowing in the core of his being that he was loved by his heavenly parent. And so it is for us here, today, now, maybe in the word of a hymn, maybe in the smile of a friend, maybe in the glimpse of a garden, maybe in the fall of snow, the gentle, quiet reminder, you are mine, you are loved. That's all, but that's enough. I'm sure some of you had the same growing up experience that I did. I, I grew up in a small town with a small church. Um, and every summer we went to camp meeting. And every fall there was a revival. Uh, every summer we'd go to camp meeting and there were two or three preaching services a day. Every night there would be an altar call inviting people to come to the altar and 
dedicate themselves to Christ. I, I grew up singing all those hymns. I still know them by heart, all to Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come, I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. As I look back on those experiences, one thing strikes me. Usually, it was we teenagers who were moved to tears and made our way to the altar. I really don't remember many adults ever feeling a need for repentance or confession or renewal. I've always kind of wondered about that because as I've gotten older, I feel that more and more. But even so, those were important moments in my life, in terms of commitment and dedication and renewal. And the fact is, we all need those moments once in a while, don't we? Those moments where we sense once again, in a new way, the presence of God's Spirit, the touch of God's grace, the reminder (coughs) of God's love. You are mine. You are loved. That's all. But that's enough. Well, Jesus is all grown up. He comes to his second cousin, John, to the waters, and he hears the prayer. He senses the spirit. He hears the voice, gentle, quiet, on the wings of of a snow-white dove, he sends his pure, sweet love, the sign from above, on the wings of a dove.